Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I am speaking again with Iona Italia. Iona is an author and she is a sub-editor at Aereo. She also hosts the Two for Tea podcast, which is affiliated with Aereo. And she is part of the team at Letter, which is an amazing social media site. Get off Twitter, get on Letter. <laughs> Even though at Twitter you can find I- Iona. Um, and also her latest book... You can bo- find me on Letter too. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and her latest book came out earlier this year and it's second part to her love letter to tango and hi ona thanks for coming iona thanks for coming back on thank you bye it's yeah. always a pleasure to talk to you so i wanted to talk, speak to you because you'd done a thread about identity and i was i i don't do threads on twitter but i did a little one just rambling about identity it's everywhere right now yes unavoidable yeah but i mean <laughs> i prefer the take of camille foster Thomas Chatterton Williams than I do about than I do of more you know, most other people like I think it's I mean even like what you're saying that the skin color thing has got to get away from identity and identity doesn't have to be so rigid and locked in anymore yes I agree um uh, Thomas Ch- talking of letter I have a letter exchange <laughs> with Thomas about his book which I yeah. recommend everybody go and read yeah. um his latest book um which is called um unlearning Self- race a self-portrait in black and white, um, and it's subtitled Unlearning Race, which is the title of the, uh, I call the conversation that we had Unlearning Race. Um, and I um, I understand um, the, the, the point of view that if we don't take race as a factor into consideration, then we risk ignoring some very real injustices and um, I think that that so so that is fair enough but um, but but our aim should be I mean if you are a sociologist a statistician then it's an it's a factor that you should take into account um, when you are looking to see uh, what effects different policies have had on society, and you also want to know how different groups are doing, how to, um, because you want to boost people who are not doing well, and you want to think about ways of of help also helping groups that are not doing well. So I understand that, but I think that as an identity, um, as an identity thing. I feel as though um, we should certainly, as far as judging people is concerned, we should try to get beyond race and racial categories as quickly as possible. Full stop. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with that. But I mean, you've written about, you know, your background, you, your Parsi, your I believe you were born in Pakistan or India, or were you born in the UK? I was. I was actually born in the UK. So my mother was. My mother flew over from Pakistan, heavily pregnant, <laughs> and I was born um, here. And then she returned whilst I was very still like a babe in arms. And on my birth certificate, it actually says that my address uh, is twelve. Um, it's um. 12 Mary Road, Bath Island, <laughs> Karachi, West Pakistan, as it still was back then. I was born before <laughs> the foundation of Bangladesh. That dates me. Um, yeah, so even on my birth certificate, as I was born in the UK, it said that my address was 12 Mary Road, Bath Island, West Kar- Karachi, West Pakistan. So, um, yeah, I was, my mother was Scottish. My mother was, um, but, so, I'm I'm not sure uh, the extent to which this has changed, but uh, at that time, if you were born in the UK, if one of your parents was born in the, if both your parents were born in the UK, uh, you are a UK citizen regardless of where you were born. But if only one of your parents was born in the UK, then then your citizenship you were, you would only be a UK citizen. If that parent had um, been living resident in the UK within a certain number of years of your birth, and I think that my mother didn't fit those, didn't meet those requirements, 
So if I had not been born in the UK, I would have been a Pakistani citizen only. Okay. Um, so that's the reason why my mother dashed over. <laughs> it was probably legal, I don't know. But anyway, she dashed over. I was born here. And I am a UK citizen. And in fact, I am no longer a Pakistani citizen because I am... Um, um, I, I, I became an Argentine citizen. I'm a naturalized Argentine citizen. I became a citizen of Argentina about five years ago. And Argentina does not, Pakistan does not allow um, dual citizenship with any country other than the UK. Um, and Argentina does not allow dual citizenship with Pakistan. So my Pakistani citizenship automatically was annulled when I became an Argentine citizen. I had to give up, but <laughs> it was a great, it was a great loss. <laughs> no, I mean I have not been back to Pakistan since the late seventies, and I, um, I had never, I had a passport which was completely expired. I had never used my Pakistani passport, um, and my father was born in India and had never become a naturalized Pakistani citizen very luckily which also enabled me to go to india because yeah. uh, my father never became a pack citizen yeah my, okay my mother has that problem now she was born in mm. india she grew up in mm. karachi mm. so when she goes back to india she's a canadian citizen has a canadian passport um i think back when we became citizens she couldn't have dual citizenship um they, they changed that recently but yeah pa um, yeah pa um Oh, no, but even with India, she had an I, Indian passport. Oh, with India, right? Yeah. She had dual with. Yeah, you can't can no yeah. longer have yeah. a dual citizenship yeah. with India. So, so she, um, so when she was when she came to Canada, she still had, um, like she still had the Indian citizenship, but she she became Canadian. She had to give up the Indian. But when she goes back to India now, she doesn't mention anything of her about her Pakistani family because it'll affect her visa. My right. uncle, my uncle, who was her her younger brother, who was born in Karachi has been refused a visa to go to India with his wife, who's from India. Yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> absurd. Did you see that recently um, Artish Tasir, the writer, um, quite mm -hmm. eminent Indian writer, mm -hmm. has been stripped of his... Um, he doesn't have citizenship anymore be mm -hmm. because he's a US citizen, but he's been... Modi has stripped him of his um, overseas Indian... The resident card, so, um, yeah, his, it's not a residency card. So the OCI, Overseas Citizen of India, which is a thing that used to be the um, person of Indian, PIO status, person of Indian origin, now is, mm. is the Overseas Citizen. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Modi has stripped him of his citizenship. His mother, uh, he, because, and the reason given was that um, his father was a Pakistani citizen. <laughs> Um, but his mother was an Indian citizen. He was born and grew up in India. His mother still lives in India. Um, and I think that he not only he's not even permitted to, to enter on a tourist visa. He can never go back to India. And all his books are set in India. It's just extraordinary. Uh, no, but yeah, just keep, extraordinary. For yourself as well. You lived in India for a few years and you were going back and forth between India and Argentina, I believe, right? You were kind of a few... Uh, no, well, I just, I went to India for two years. Um, okay. I wasn't going back and forth. I just okay, I no, went sorry. to India and then I, later I came back to Argentina okay. and now I live in the UK. <laughs> it's very confusing, I know. Okay, now if you look at, mm. are you when you're in India, right? Mm. Now you can claim mm. ancestry or <laughs> Pakistan, India, the, the Indian subcontinent, right? It's, it's, it's I don't want to say it's one group yeah. of people. Well, but my, yes, my father was from Bombay. Yeah. So my father was actually from India, yeah. even though in any case, when my father was born, Pakistan didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a friend of mine insists that she was not born in Lahore, Pakistan. She was born in Lahore, India. Yeah, but see, that's yeah, the thing. Which is, which is, you know, technically that is correct. Now, um, like your identity then. Right? Like because this, this, this is where it bugs me. Like, my identity for me is Canadian. Yes, I was born in India. I have connections to it. My father, you know, his his family goes back to Yemen. 
but you know that's five generations he was very proud of his indian heritage he talked about indian history he loved the classical music you know everything and so i got a connection to india through my father but myself personally if i think about myself in that sense like i think canadian so you became an argentine citizen you were living in argentina then you go to india for a couple of years now you're still iona but yes. now are you you know like i have friends who um like Russell Peters is an Indian comic from Canada. Makes a joke about the, about the first time you went to oh, India. Yes. Yeah. I, I love Russell Peters. <laughs> yeah. So when he, t- he makes a joke about the first time you went to visit India. He's like, "I'm going to be the most Indian person. I'll show you how to be Indian." Blah 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 blah. He's like, "Then I get off the plane and I smell." <laughs> you know, then he makes a joke about that, right? Like, so I get that sensation from sometime from people who, you know, family and stuff who go back to India or Pakistan. It's like, and they come back. Okay, fine. You find a sense of where you were, but they want to reject everything. You know, some of them were born in Canada. They want to reject everything about Canada now. I'm like, you know, your identity is not just where you're born, where you're from. Like, when you're in Argentina and you're, you have your friends, you have your social group, do you feel more Argentine than when you're in India? Like, do you feel more Indian in India? Do you feel, or do you feel different and out of place in both places? Uh, so it's interesting. You know, I've never felt, um, terribly at home in Argentina. Um, the reason, the thing that bound me to Argentina was dancing Argentine tango. Okay. And if you're serious about dancing tango, you need to be in Buenos Aires. It's Buenos Aires or fuck off. You know, if you really, <laughs> if you want to pursue a professional career. Um, and um, I... Um, it's not, it's not that, I mean, Buenos Aires is also has many charms. I think it has probably one of the nicest climates of any city. It's just kind of perfect. It's like a sort of U- European, it's like a kind of nice but cool, cool summer's day in in Northern Europe for most of the year. Okay. Um, you know, it's just a lovely, lovely, it's a delightful climate. It's, it's, a um, there's, there's a lot of beautiful architecture. It's, it has this kind of faded charm. It's like a rundown, very rundown version of Paris um, with some very degenerate kind of Italians living there. Um, well. And I, so I, I mean, I, I mean, I do, I, I didn't enjoy many things about Argentina, but I just, I felt, I never felt at home there. And so, um, because I, uh, for 11 years, my life was entirely centered around uh, dancing tango, teaching tango. Um, and so I, I, that all changed when I decided to go to India. Um, and after I came back from India, I was also injured and I spent a lot of time not able to dance at all. And I felt just, when I came back from India, I felt so so alienated in uh, Buenos Aires. And I'd never felt, as I said, I, I mean, although I, I I like my Argentine friends and I'm not, I'm not a critic of Argentine culture. It's more that I just never felt this was my scene or my culture, apart from the dancing. So when my life wasn't centered around dancing anymore, I just felt completely like a fish out of water there. And uh, that's why I decided to move back to the UK. Um, and I, uh, you know, I felt very, I felt very at home in India. And it was really, it was a strange um, experience. Because, so, and I think much of this may be, imagine, may be imaginary. I do think that identity is very fungible. And um, people are highly suggestible where their identity is concerned, especially mixed race people who have kind of options. <laughs> um, and I, um, so I, I'm very British in lots of ways. And I don't feel Pakistani at all, even though that's where I spent my um, early childhood. But British culture is much more, in a sense, it's much more familiar to me. It's much more user friendly. Um, I, it's kind of effortless uh, to get along with people and know how to behave and know what's up and how things work. Um, And in that sense, I feel at home here. 
and I feel very, very much at home right here. I know you're not recording <laughs> video, but I'm pointing <laughs> downwards to the floor right here in this specific house because um, I uh, one of the reasons I moved back to the UK is to move in with um, old friends. So I live with college friends. Um, it's a very unusual usual and lovely situation. I live with four uh, guys, crazy men, um, who are old and close friends of mine. So it's not like an ordinary shared house situation. It feels to me like a family. It feels like being in a family. So um, I do feel very at home here in Britain. But when I went to India, I felt at home in a very di in a different kind of way. On the one hand, India was really alien to me. And the first couple of weeks that I was there were really hard. I had severe culture shock. I had all the usual kinds of um, things that a foreigner has. It doesn't help that where I was living, I lived in the Charney Road um, area of Bombay. For anybody who knows Bombay, it's a crazy part of the city. Um, and I was living in this little tiny uh, Dharamsala, which is like a, a hostel, um, was a Zoroastrian hostel. Um, and I could, from inside my room, and my room was the most Spartan monastic um, a room that I had ever, I think, been in, let alone stayed in, in my entire life. It had like an old broken sewing machine in a corner covered in dust and spider webs. And then this um, iron framed bed with a bare mattress and and um, and, a, and a cupboard which had all the wood chipping off which was really you had to be careful when you touched it or you would get splinters when you open the door and that was it you're really <laughs> and, selling the place um, <laughs> and inside the room with my window closed I had to I couldn't I couldn't have a uh, make a phone call from inside my room with the window closed because it was so loud. That's how noisy it was, <laughs> the street. It was a constant cacophony of people sounding their horns. There was traffic and it, it looked like, it looked the way that um, Buenos Aires can, street can look when there is a demonstration on. We have a lot of political demonstrations in Argentina, and when there's a demonstration going on, and there's a big crowd of people marching down the street, mm. that's what that street looked like, like day and night, 24 hours, <laughs> except also with cows and traffic and mopeds and constant blaring of horns. And it, it, and it smelled so bad, and I was immediately it got ill from, from, the, <laughs> bacteri from, <laughs> from the bacteria. Um, and I was just everything about India seemed crazy to me. Um, but I, when I, and, and, and things were dirty in a way that I had just not never experienced in the West. Um, you know, if you pass a gap between two houses, that gap would be piled sky high with like a festering rubbish heap. Um, it was just, <laughs> it, 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 it just, it was a shock to the system. India was a real shock to the system when I arrived. Um, I later moved away from Charney Road. In fact, I lived in a really lovely part of Bombay later. And I got kind of completely acclimatized to the um, to the noise and the crowds and those kinds of things. And later I also visited some other less, less crowded places. Um, so... And I don't speak any Indian languages. I did speak Gujarati when I was growing up, but I, it's basically gone. Um, and I certainly can't understand Hindi or Marathi. Occasionally, if I see if someone is speaking really, really slowly, I can recognize the odd word that is similar to a Guju word. But in general, uh, pretty much nothing, you know, normal conversational hmm. pace. No Telugu, no Karnatak? No what? No Telugu, no Karnatak? You never spoke any well, Telugu? No, <laughs> no, no. I mean, we spoke, um, my father spoke Gujarati because he was a Parsi. Yeah. The Parsis all speak Gujarati. And, um, but we spoke, I mean, my mother didn't speak any Indian languages. So we spoke English at home when I was growing up. And I went to an English medium uh, primary school. 
as as you know many Indians yeah. and Pakistanis do. Um, and so really, uh, it uh, so when I arrived, it felt it felt very alien in that way. And um, but it also felt there were some things felt extraordinarily familiar, and it was just like it was. Not the smell of rubbish, the bad smells, but some of the other smells, like the um, the the fact that at six six p.m. At, at dusk, people would come around in our flat and they would sense it with um, uh, with a with a, one of the clinging sensor things, mm-hmm. with sandalwood, and big clouds of fragrant sandalwood would gust through the air, and the association of smelling sandalwood at dusk that was so familiar to me also waking to the sound of crows on my window sill um and there were many many things like that the feel of the air against my skin the kind of sensation of the air in the pre-monsoon season um the way uh foods food tasted which was completely different from indian food in the west I'm kind of spoiled for Indian food now. I have to say, I can't eat London Indian food anymore. Oh, I okay. It was great. I'm the same I, way. Okay, so. but th- this is because of family and stuff. Like my mum is an amazing cook. Well, your mom, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but you know, friends I'm will say, to visit. I'm yeah, my, meet you oh, come come down. Here. You're more than welcome. <laughs> but you know, my friends will say, go try this Indian restaurant. I'm like, I've eaten there. It's garbage. They're like, oh, it's great. I'm like, no, it's not. It's not good at all. <laughs> and then yeah, and I'm the, like. The only one that I have enjoyed is Dishoom. So there's a there's a Parsi uh, restaurant, restaurant in, London, in London now chain, and they're actually quite authentic. Um, still not not as Bombay. The other Indian restaurants I've tried, I just feel like this bears no resemblance to anything I ate in India. Exactly. <laughs> I don't like it. Um, but just so that and and I mean all of the kind of the kinds of sen- sensory things, um, just um brought back very intense uh, memories for me. It was like I, I described at one point I said it was like be, even though I grew up in Pakistan and I was in mm-hmm. India, nevertheless I grew up in the Parsi Bagh, the Parsi uh, gated community mm-hmm. in Pakistan and I lived in the Parsi community in Bombay um, and the cultural similarities were just in, uh, were just enormous. And I just, you know, I just had this constant feeling of kind of, it was like walking, it was like walking through a field that was landmined with memories. You know, at every step, some memory was liable to explode in your face. Um, And I also felt, um, uh, you know, there are a lot of aesthetic things to it. Like, I love the, the taste the tastes of Indian food, the kind of colors that Indians prefer. I like those colors. I like that aesthetic and I also feel just I find um, I found the human experience very warm and I really found despite a lot of kind of cultural issues um, with the Indians the non-representative kind of middle class Indians I guess who I knew I found them very very much easier to relate to than Argentines whom I knew for example um, I felt very, I found the way of kind of thinking about things and approaching things, a sort of opinionated, argumentative, a slightly philosophical, very kind of freewheeling Indian thing. I found that just, um, that seemed familiar, both familiar and kind of relatable to me. I just, I felt, so I felt actually... I felt a quite deep sense of belonging in India and especially in the Parsi community. Now, I have a slightly, okay, I born in India. My family moved to Canada when I was six. First time I went back to India, I was 10. I'd started losing Urdu a little bit because my parents kind of did push us to pick up English. And it was just before we went back. So maybe I was about nine. And my mom asked me for- Where, Where did you grow up? In Montreal. Oh, no, I, I mean, in India, I, I was I was born in Hyderabad, so I lived in Hyderabad till I was six. Oh and, yes, you did tell me that. Yeah, and so when, like I said, when my mum, around the time I was about about nine, like I, I don't want to give an exact, I don't want to give an exact age, but around there, eight or nine, she asked me for a pillow, but she asked me for Nordu, and I was like, "What's that?" 
you know, she said, you know, you know, she said, give me that, you know, give me the pillow. And I was like, what do you want me to give you? And I didn't, I, it's only been a couple of years and I started losing some of it because at home they would speak to us in order we'd reply back in English. Mm-hmm. You know, they wanted us to pick up the English. They wanted us to assimilate. I was learning English in, in India before I came here even, uh, before I came here. So when I went back the first time, again, part of it is the language, I think. Uh, but I mean, I, I got better at my Urdu and we went back for the whole summer. So by the end of the summer, my Urdu was back to you know, being my mother tongue again, basically. Uh, but there was little things. Like I felt more out of place going back to India that first time than I ever did coming to Canada as a new country at six years old, going to new schools. And then on top of that, my, my parents, for whatever reason, I went from kindergarten to grade six, I went to eight different schools. So I was going to a new school every year. So I was always an outsider. I was always a new person. But I felt, like I said, when I went back to India that one time, it's just even the things like, in order they'll say, and I mean, it's the same thing in India, like, Aploga, you people, right? So whenever one of my members of my family was talking to me, They'd consider me as, oh, you people in the West. You, like, so I got that. Um, mm. You know, so whenever I went back to India until later on, I, like I said, I felt like an outsider. Even my mom, like, when she would go back, you know, my, my dad as well. My mom's wearing a sari. She's walking down the street. But by because of her shoes, the way she holds herself and everything, they know that she's an outsider. And they, they treat mm-hmm. her slightly differently. So they're, they're like, she doesn't have that Indian identity or Pakistani identity, I guess. Same thing with my father, he would, but my father, I mean, he would just, he, all his friends, everything where he would just like soak right back in. Um, but the only other time I felt that out of place and that conscious of my identity was when the PC, PC stuff started in the late eighties. And now this identity politics, like the com- c- continual focus on your identity. I, I mean, I would have, you know, it was like a fetishization, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to talk about microaggressions or anything like that, but it was just always pointing out your differences. And this, this you know, I call them benevolent bigots because they, they, it seems like they're coming out of a place of goodness or whatever, but always focusing on your differences, always, you know, like I go down, you know, hang out with some friends. Oh, well, uh, you know, don't give them pork. It's like, you don't even ask me. You don't even know what I want. It just, just, just decide it for me, right? And it was things like mm-hmm. that. And they're, they're doing it to be inclusive or whatever, right? So, yeah. Like the, this forced identity, that's the thing I don't like about this identity politics. Um, you know, if Kanye puts on a MAGA hat, he's no longer black. Apparently, if you don't vote for Joe Biden, you're not black, right? I mean, like like that kind of identity. That's where I'm getting, you know, like what you're talking about, okay, you felt at home in India. I feel more at home in Montreal than I do anywhere else. I grew up here. All my friends are here. I love traveling. I love going anywhere. You know, aside from growing up here, no, I don't have any historical connection to Montreal. I have more of a historical connection to, to India. Enjoyed here, and I love going back to India. I love visiting with my family. I love, you know, I, I don't like the big cities. I, you know, I prefer going to like smaller places in like Kerala and things like that. Or if I want to go to a city, Bangalore is about as big as I want to get. <laughs> you know, you should, you should go down to Oroville. Yeah. To other places that are, I mean, that's kind of, that's unique, and it's not really India. I think actually, even legally, it's not. It's it's not kind of Indian soil. It's its own thing, yeah. but uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like next time I, I go back, I I'll check it. Recommend it. Yeah. I mean, I go back now just to see my family. You know, my my brother's family's there, and you know, my niece is there, and I've still got uncles. And you know, for me, going to India is to visit family. It's not so much a tourist thing. I've traveled around the country, so. But I, still, but I mean, this. I th- Yeah, I think that. Yeah. Sorry. Go go ahead. No, it's like saying this this <clears> identity <throat> thing. I I still make this claim that if we go back to North America, we had gotten to I think to a point where the color of your skin didn't matter for your identity. It was starting to be like that, I think, by the late 90s. And then there was a shift towards not, you know, like now it's full bore identity, but back then in the late 90s, a shift towards there's some inequalities. These inequalities have to do with race. So let's focus on racism. Then mm-hmm. the focus on identity, it just started building up and building up and building up. Candace Owens, like I said, Candace Owens isn't really black. Uh, Pete Buttigieg isn't really gay because he doesn't embrace queerness. Uh, you know, like all this nonsense. I mean, identity is, to me, identity is who you think you are, who you think you feel. You have to be comfortable with yourself. Like if you're uncomfortable with yourself, if you hate yourself, like I don't think you can really try to figure out who you are. I mean, 
the color of your skin, where you're born, shouldn't matter to your identity at all. Like, mm. I mean, it, it, may, it plays some part of it, but it shouldn't be your identity. Right now. Well, it can be your identity if you want, want it to be. I mean, I think that there is a big difference between chosen identities and constrained identities. Mm. So I think that I could have, if I had, um, so my, I mean, if I had not gone back to India and I had lived here all of my life, I would still be the same uh, person. And I could have chosen not to go to India and just to feel and think of myself as British. I think that that would be an option. Um, and what is problematic is when other people are trying to dictate to you how you should feel and identify. I think that if it's, I, I find, I think it's very, it's analogous to gender roles. So um, if you, um, if you enjoy, for example, if you enjoy being a stay at home wife or mother or whatever, if you like being very girly and wearing a lot of lipstick and high heels and frilly skirts, as I do, um, if you want to watch Sex in the City and kind of, I don't know, dance around your handbag, um, or, um, you know, if you just enjoy being stereotypically um, female and you want to identify with that, I, I don't have a problem with that at all. That's fine. If you and you your, if you and your partner live in a really traditional household, he is the breadwinner, you are staying at home doing the washing and cleaning the house and making dinner, I'm 100% on board with that. Um, but it's, it's when it's a constraint that it's a problem. It's when it's women can't go to work or men must go to work and won't, you know, can't stay at home or women aren't allowed to do this and that or you're not a real woman if you do X and Y. Um, I think that um, chosen identities can be, can be fun. It makes you feel like you're connected to something greater than yourself. And if you, um, if you want that greater connection to be racial, that's fine. If you don't want if you want it to be geographical that's fine if you don't really feel like um if you feel like you're just a citizen of the world that's also fine to me and i think that um i mean in my own case this has to do with i think it has to a lot has to do with the way in which my own life panned out so i without telling you the entire story yeah. of my life, but um, my um, my parents died when I was, they died slightly apart from each other, but when I was 10, I'm averaging it. Mm. Uh, my mother when I was nine, and then my father died when I was 11. But basically when I was 10, um, a few things happened within kind of a year. Um, I, my parents died. I came to the UK. Um, I went to a boarding school. Actually, my parents died after I arrived, but um, but basically all these events took place at around the same time. I went to boarding school, which I absolutely hated. I wasn't adopted. I, I was kind of staying with different relatives. And um, I never, that was the end of my connection with my, the Indian and Parsi side of myself. So I had in the UK, I had no uh, Parsi connections, no Indian connections at all, or Pakistani, no, uh, no further contact with anybody from that kind of culture, nothing. And um, because I look, because I'm fair skinned, and so to many people, I look white, mm -hmm. although it's quite surprisingly, um, um, I Quite surprisingly, quite a lot of people thought that I was Indian when I was in India. Um, I think partly because I was tanned and also they were expecting a Parsi to look more fair. And I was wearing, um, and I was wearing uh, kurta uh, um, and churidar or sari all the time also. Um, but I think that, um, but most, even in India, most people kind of read me as being European. And people always, I mean, one reason why I hate this kind of idea that 
um, people can classify you immediately from how you look is that people looked at me and they just said, you are white, you go into this category. The, the, and nothing else matters. It's just we see this and therefore that's who you are. And, um, and they tell you not to be I, racist as well when they do that. <laughs> um, and I, um, I was, I mean, I, I, it was kind of a traumatic experience, my, uh, my experiences around age 10. Um, and so I just, I became a, I was a very, very introverted uh, and troubled child. Um, and I just completely cut off all connection with um, that side of myself. And I, I felt later, I felt as though it would be almost sort of fake to lay claim to it because I had spent so much time in the UK and I didn't speak Gujarati and I didn't hand. I, I, you know, I was no longer growing up in the Parsi community, etc. And it was really, I was having sort of, I guess, a midlife crisis when I decided, um, largely with the help of Zubin Madden, who is somebody I encountered on Twitter. You should go and check him out, at Z. I think there's more than one Zubin Madden. So really, really, both Zubin and Madden are really common Parsi names, but he's at Z Madden. Is he in the Holland right now, or am I thinking of someone else? In Holland, no, I don't. I think he's. I don't think he's left India in ages. Okay, I'm thinking um, of someone else. Then who? Like the name is the the first name is kind of similar. And I I could be just messing uh, it up. Well, Zubin is a really common name. I actually hmm. have another another Zub. I have several Zubins among <laughs> my <laughs> mutuals. Um, uh, and Madden is also, we don't have that many surname, Parsi surnames, so Madden is also a really common surname. Um, anyways, um, partly through Zubin, so I'm just giving him a shout out. Um, I decided that I wanted to reconnect with um, that side of myself. So that's when I decided to go and live in India. And two years was the maximum visa that I was able to get. So that's why I stayed for only two years. Otherwise, I might well have stayed for longer or still be there. And it just, coming to India, felt it felt as though I had all these dangling, fraying, loose ends of myself, and I was knitting them up into, into the tapestry. Um, that's how it felt. It felt like kind of a completion. It's one of the most um, important things that I have done for me, for me personally. And it wasn't every, uh, lots of people, not everyone, but lots of people um, kind of Im imagine that I must have had a spiritual experience in India or gone to India for spiritual reasons. And as I always tell people, I'm religious, but I'm not spiritual. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I'm kind of an agnostic. I think it's unlikely that anybody is up there, but I really enjoy being connected with mm. Zoroastrian culture and going to the Agyari. Um, and I say a few prayers just in case, because I mean, I, I talk to myself anyway, so what's the difference? Yeah. Um, I might as well also talk to myself in the Agyari. Um, so it's more atmospheric, you know, it's got, you get some social approval for it. Um, so I, um, I'm not spiritual at all, but it was kind and I didn't, I didn't go to any ashrams or, or anything like that when I was in India. I didn't do yoga, <laughs> nothing. Um, but I did feel, I did go on a Zoroastrian pilgrimage. I just felt like the whole trip was a kind of pilgrimage in search of myself, if that doesn't sound, that sounds incredibly wanky, I know. But no, no, again, I get that. nothing wrong with masturbation. It's a perfectly harmless activity. Okay. Um, uh <laughs> no, but I mean, like, so, something along those lines. Like, like I said, I've gone back to India. You know, my father would talk, tell us about the history. I've read books and things. You know, obviously, I, I don't know as much as maybe I should. I I feel a connection to that in the same way that I'm not going to say, well, Western civilization gave us this, this, and this. And I can, yes, it came from here. I can say, look at these things. They're great. But I'm not going to take any specific pride, in, nor am I going to take any specific pride in something that came from India. Like, I can say this came from India. This was a good thing. Or this came from Canada. This was a good thing. This came from the West. This was a good thing. But it's, it's been, like I have no responsibility for the good or the bad of that. 
but if you want to go back and look at where you came from, like I, I get that. Like I, I've gone back to India a few times. I travel around. Like I'll speak with my family, you know, my grandparents, great aunts, great uncles. You know, history that like where the family came from and and you know the history of Hyderabad and things like that. Always been interested in that. Uh, in two thousand three, I was planning on taking my parents. It was going to be my parents' thirtieth anniversary in two thousand four. Or thirtieth or thirty fifth, sorry, in two thousand four. So I, my, like I said, my dad's got Yemeni origins. My mom's got origins from there as well, like the Middle East. My dad had a lot of family still in Yemen, and so back then it wasn't as it wasn't like it's now. And I said, well, I was doing, I was making really good money, and I said, okay, well, for your thirty fifth anniversary, why don't we plan a trip to Sanaa? And like, you know, that's where I'm from. Like, I have roots there. I'd like to see where I came from. I get that. Unfortunately, never had a chance. My dad passed away before that happened. But so oh, I, I'm I, sorry. Uh, you know, I think, but like I guess I, I have no issue with you know people wanting to get back to their roots or whatever. But you know, you don't take like you see some. Like I said, I've seen people who take one trip to India and they come back and they're wearing kurtas all the time, and the, you know they 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 put on a. That's me. Uh, I'm wearing uh, I'm wearing kurtas all the time. Well, now. Okay. okay. Um, like my, literally. Okay. My my <laughs> my dad my dad um, wore kurtas all the time here in Canada, but he said these are way more comfortable than shirts. Oh, okay. If he was going to a business meeting or something like that, he would put on a shirt, and if he did the same thing in India, but I'm saying they come back because I'm Indian, or like you know. Someone going to Africa and coming back and just wearing dakshikis. That's it. You know, like I've got, like, it, it was kind of like that thing. Like I've reclaimed my Indian heritage. It's like you, born in Canada, you grew up here. I understand getting back your thing. But to me, that's a. Well, I think, I think people just, um, I mean, I had, I had a, I have a friend who is half Argentine and half Japanese. Mm-hmm. And um, he went through a Japanese phase, as he put it. So he went to Japan for, um, he he grew up in Argentina with his Japanese dad. Um, his his mother was deceased, and he grew up with his Japanese dad, but in Argentina. Um, then he went to uh, to do his he did his undergraduate degree in Tokyo, in, and he said that he kind of he he described it as sort of infatuation that he fell in love with Japanese ness with his own Japanese ness, um, and. He arrived back and he kind of redecorated his flat so that he had a futon and tatami mats and all this. And he started wearing Japanese clothes and he was eating only Japanese food. And um, he was just really into his his whole Japanese thing. But then he got over it, as he put it, and mm-hmm. um, and went back to his, his old kind of basically Argentine ways. And... Um, but, you know, I think that there is, it would have also been okay if he had stayed with his Japanese thing. I don't, I'm a, I don't really believe in authenticity. You know, I think authenticity is a mirage. Um, and I don't, um, you know, I, I also know some white people who've, who've returned from India and they're now really, really into yeah. everything Indian. And I think that's absolutely fine. Um I think that culture is is up for grabs, and if you have um, if you have a genetic connection with a culture, it's easier. It's more accessible to you. It's easier for you to claim it, and if you like the thing, you might as well claim it. Um, so, I, and I have definitely. I was just talking about this to Aisha. Uh, a canby who I just interviewed yeah. for for my podcast. Um, I've heard her talk a couple of times. She's have, awesome. I said it, she uh, is amazing. Uh, yeah, amazing. So, sorry, and she's a fashion that. stylist. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking about fashion, and I mentioned that um, before I went to India, um, I had a lot of. Um, I I mean, I almost always wore I I always wore Western clothes, and um, I have a lot of beautiful clothes um and after i oh i went to india and at first i was wearing i was wearing only indian clothes the entire time i was in india i wore only indian dress the Mm. entire time and i think that i um at first it was a practical thing i wanted to stand out less 
I wanted to, I went out in the sun, tried to get tanned and put on Indian clothes and tried to be more, just blend in more. Um, and uh, it worked, actually. I mean, at least partially worked. Um, and I, so at first it was a practicality thing. I didn't want to be like a tourist target um, and ha be kind of molested by scammers to get sexually harassed, but I didn't want to be molested by scammers and beggars and things yeah. like that. Um, but it very quickly became a really strong part of my identity. And even though most of my Indian friends didn't wear in um you know wore indian clothes only sometimes mm -hmm. or some of them almost never wore indian clothes i nevertheless always wore indian clothes and um since i've been back i'm wearing western clothes now partly because i've got very fat <laughs> over lockdown so things have got a little little tight um but i have I think this is one of only two days when I've worn Western clothes in the past year uh, since I've been back from India. Um, I mean, I came back and I just continued wearing Indian clothes. And I really feel like I have a whole wardrobe full of um, Western clothes. And my, my kurtas and things are actually wearing out now because they were very thin cotton to begin yeah. with. And I have worn them to death. And I just, um, nevertheless, I feel, every morning I feel like, okay, I'm going to wear Western clothes today. And I think, nah, I just, I, I just, oh, I don't know. Somehow I just don't want to wear Western clothes. Okay. See, now, <laughs> uh. <laughs> I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about something like that. I'm talking about someone who, you, you like the clothing you wear, wear what feel, you, you feel comfortable. Like my mom. She'll but it's go, more than just um, liking. It's but, really no, but what what it, you feel comfortable in, and yeah, and, and, and comfortable just doesn't mean like it's a comfortable fit. Like how you feel in the clothes where you are. Like my mum, she goes back to India. I she'll only wear like kurtas and shalwars or saris, like nothing else. But when she's here, day to day, whatever she wears, Western style clothing, and it's not that she's embarrassed of her you know if she's going to a friend's place and she's going to dinner or something she'll put on a sari she'll get in an uber and her sari and she'll go like it's not like she's embarrassed of it i don't know is that internalized racism that she feels more comfortable here that she has to wear western clothes it's okay i'll give you another example of the opposite thing like this okay two of them one trudeau on his little trip to india like all his little stuff that he did that's the kind of stuff i'm talking about like you know when he, he trudeau a couple of years ago when he went to india oh, you know, he's always there, dressing there like that there we disagree again. Oh, no, no, no. I, 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 I thought that I liked it. No, no. He, okay, he was essentializing everything. That's what he does every single time, but I don't even want to get into that. But if you want, we can. But like my brother-in-law, my dad, he is a musician. Mm. He's a good musician. He's like, especially on stringed instruments. He had some interest in sitar and my, like I said, my dad loved classical Indian music and stuff. So he picked up an interest in that. And my dad got him a sitar had a sitar made for him from i forget the guy's name but he's considered in the top five or if not in the top three of sitar players in the world so this guy made a sitar for my you know my dad commissioned a sitar got it made from this guy uh this person actually had even pay, played my parents basement in montreal um uh, and so my he's learning to play sitar and he's, he's actually fairly good now he's been learning they got married in 98 he's been taking lessons since then a couple of years after they got married, he was saying something to me. I think it was maybe about five. And he said, well, you know, in our culture. And I just looked at him. And I said, what are you talking about? Our culture. Okay. You play the sitar and you married into an Indian family. And now you say a few words in Urdu. Like, what do you mean our culture? And I looked at him. I said, my culture is more Canadian than it is Indian. And it was something to do with he was in school my sister was working but my sister was still doing the housework and stuff and he was trying to defend him like i didn't even ask him about that he started trying to, kind of trying to defend himself he's like well you know in our culture women do and i'm like what's our culture i mean his his father was scandinavian and irish i think and his mom was scottish i mean his culture is when white met bread I, you know i i don't care that he likes the sitar i don't care just because he married my sister he has no claim to that culture like to say that's our culture now 
you like it, you appreciate it. And I have no problem with that. I'm not just one of those cultural appropriation people, but to talk about it like it's yours, like that's the kind of thing that I find Trudeau does. He fetishizes it. He, you know, the way he dressed everywhere he went, it was like you would dress at a wedding. No one dresses like that in formal events. And he was going to formal meetings doing that. He's coming to give a, a speech and he comes in doing the Mangara. No, no. He, he, if you look at the pictures of him, when he goes, does native stuff, he puts on this headdress. I mean, he always dresses. He essentializes what it means to be that thing. And he focuses on it. He's a racist piece of crap. That's my take on Trudeau. And I can get further into it if you want, but it's a waste of time right now. It's way, but like I said, it's the thing with my brother-in-law, like that's not his culture. It's, it's not even really mine. Like I have claim to it. I can, I have heritage from it. Culturally, I'm Canadian. I think I can respect my Indian thing. I, I'm not telling anyone how to do it, but I really, if you were born, like my cousins who were born here, who grew up here, yet they still say, say, no, I'm Indian. You know, they play hockey. They, everything they do is Canadian, but no, I'm Indian. It's like, no, you're not. Like, what, they, what do you think they mean when they say they're Indian? Why, why do you think that's important to them? Um, I don't know the language, the food. I have no idea. Like, Again, it's part of this identity thing. Like they grew up in ghettoized neighborhoods. You know, majority of the people who they live around are all Indians. The the schools are kind of broken down until you know there's the black kids, the Indian kids, the white kids. Uh, I went to a school that was almost all white. I never. I had people ask me about it. My friends asked me. My friends' parents, out of a genuine interest, not just this. Oh, you're Indian. You have to be Indian. Like I don't. I don't know quite what they meant, but it was just like, I'm not Canadian, I'm Indian. And then they get, then they'll be pissed off when there's like, oh, well, they don't let us assimilate. I'm like, well, you're kind of want to keep yourself apart. Like, I, I, I don't know. I'll, maybe I should ask them exactly what they mean, but that was the kind of attitude I'd get from them. Like, I'm not Canadian. Yes, ask, yes, ask, yes, ask them, ask them. Because I think it would be interesting to know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. no, but, I don't know. I don't really... I, I don't really have a problem with, with that. I guess that um, civic nationalism is important. So I think it's it's more important. It's more troubling to me that they don't feel Canadian despite having been born and grown up there. Um, no, but they take part than, of they take part I, of all of it. Like I said, they, they'll play the hockey. They'll, you know, tell, they'll go out and drink beer or whatever. You know, like beer is about as Canadians. Like they don't, aside from the food and the language, they but don't do anything think, that's Indian. Like you're like they they right. they I they do everything that's Canadian, but they identify as Indian. Like that's. Um, but I also do feel that people should identify however they yeah. wish. So I don't think there should be any kind of. Um, I don't think we should thought police how people identify. Okay, I, I, I was I was just going to say that. Like, sorry, <laughs> I, I I'm not trying to like I I, I want to get away from that essentialism. But if they say I'm, but when like, like I said, I I don't pro, I haven't probed too much, but they always focus on you know oh well. They focus on well. That's where I'm. That's where I'm from. That's where my family's from. You know, uh, or the food and the language. Well, I I always say that I'm an Indian food supremacist. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, but um, an Indian culinary supremacist, and uh, quite a lot of people have joined me in that movement. We're going to have an ethno state, but for lovers of Indian food, <laughs> it's going to be um, in my state. There will be food purity. Only Indian food will be allowed. And no mashing? Uh, sorry? And no mashing? No, mash <laughs> no mashing. No, Helen will definitely, she'll be on a watch list. We will not even allow her tourist visa. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, like, I, I don't want to make too much of this, but it's just this this idea that, again, part of it comes from, like, I, I should have, just I, say in case, in case anybody listening doesn't know, um, Helen Pluckrose, who is my boss, <laughs> who is, um, is an aficionado of completely tasteless food. She does the most, she takes food that is already not great, and then she mashes the living fuck out of it anyway. until it's one big splodge. Yep. It's just, I've actually seen this in person. It's taken me many sessions of therapy to get past the, the trauma. And I still have occasional episodes of PTSD. Um, but yeah, she she likes to mash everything and n no one knows why. 
I mean, she gets she gets a lot of unfair criticism on Twitter, and many people attack her, but they don't attack her for the right reasons. No. I mean, I don't know why they're worried about her politics or anything when there is this very obvious, um, basic basically a crime against human rights that, oh, yeah. that she perpetrates almost daily. Yep, and it's anyway. But <laughs> she gets away with murder towards. <laughs> But like I said, I don't want to tell people how to be Indian, but like it, they they felt alien. And again, I think it comes down to some of these policies and things where they focus too much on race, so they make people feel alienated. And part of it is the ghettoization. Another example is my family in the UK. Some of my some of my family in the UK they live in Birmingham. Two of them, it's my cousin and her husband. And there's others who say the kind of the similar things. They own a law firm. They have about 100 lawyers working for them, plus all the other staff. They're doing well. Like, they're not poor. They're not hurting. They've got a voice. They've, you know, they're, they're people with some influence here. And they say, no, no, no. These people keep it. Oh, the, the, those white people, they keep us out. They don't want us part of the society. You know, there was, I don't know, I can't remember. I think it was Quilliam that came out with that. You know, them like 50, over 50% of like South Asian women still didn't speak English properly. And because of these ghettoized communities, or I don't know if it was South Asian Muslims or if it was just all South Asians that have to like, you know, so when you get into problems like that, where you live in those ghettoized communities, you're getting this message that's hyper racialized. And then you're having to focus on your identity based on where you're from or your skin color and making it directly about that. I think that's when it gets a problem. The problem to me is not. It's not that you're um, focusing on your um, ethnicity, skin color, etc. All of that is fine to me. Um, it's when it's when you feel from the get-go when your identity is is bound up with victimhood. Yeah. And therefore, you grow up feeling this kind of resentment, and you grow up feeling like a second-class citizen. Um, and it's really, I, I think that that we should obviously make sure that we're not treating people as second class citizens. That is super important. But it's also there's also a degree of personal responsibility that has to be involved as well. You can't, um, it you do a disservice to your children if you tell them that they cannot succeed or be accepted or be, be treated right by your society. And again, part of this ghettoization, my cousin, um, she was she's a couple of years older than me, but her family moved from Karachi to Montreal uh, the year after we did, and mm. so there was three, you know, there's three kids in our family. There was three kids in theirs, but they were all three girls. So my oldest cousin and I found this out from my youngest cousin when her kids were growing up in the states. Like she moved to Montreal, then the family, like, then the family moved to Vancouver. She went to you know middle school and high school in Vancouver. Went to college and. In there, uh, in, in California, then in Houston, she works for AT and T. Her husband works for AT and T. They they're making really you know, like they're they're American. <clears throat> so my yeah. my her, my youngest cousin in this family was telling me that this one was discouraging her s- children from having non-Muslim friends. Now that's a problem. Mm. Like, you know, mm. yeah. Again, this comes down to this idea of victimhood. This idea of You've been aggrieved upon because of your identity. So cling to that identity and we'll tell you what it is. Like it's all of this to me comes down to is it's people like telling you why that's your identity. Like I said, I have an issue with my cousins say that, but I'm not forcing them to say anything else. I'm not telling them. I just don't get it. I don't think it's right or wrong is not an issue of this. I, I think it's a wrong way to look at identity, but. I'm not going to tell them what their Indian identity is, right? Like, mm, mm. you know, no one can tell me I don't have any claim to India because I was born there. I go back there. I have family there. No, I'm not Indian like someone. I, I think you have more Indian <laughs> identity than I do, but you know, because you lived there for two years. I would go, I go back for a visit for a month or two. <laughs> you know, like. Well, no, it's also because I, cho- it's because I choose to. No, yeah. though, it's because I choose to. And I do think when you say, um, when you talk about having claim or not claim on an identity, that's where I want to push back because I think that 
Um, so one thing that's one one of the most the most Argentine thing is Argentine tango. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give I'm going to give that example um, to depersonalize this a little bit. Um, and um, but Argentine tango has been denoted has has been designated by the UN has has designated Argentine tango um, the patrimony of humanity. It's a cultural patrimony of humanity. Um, and I feel that um, tango is out there. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And therefore, everybody has a claim to it. Uh, you may have contributed more or less because uh, because of your your personal actions, because of your dancing or your music or what or or your teaching or DJing or whatever it might be. Um, but the is not. Um, it's uh, there's no kind of there's no like little genetic. Um, there's no a gene in your genome that says. Okay, you're allowed to dance tango, and this other person is not. There's no genetic swipe card. Yeah. Um, there's no kind of membership, and I think that the I feel the same way about Indian culture. Also, um, I feel that Indian culture is out there. It's a um, it's a very rich and fascinating culture. If you are really into into it. Saris are beautiful. If you are uh, have never been to India in your life, but you just really like saris and you want to wear saris every day, and you're from you're living in Finland or whatever, that's fine by me. For me, that's completely fine. It's culture may be created by specific people, but it doesn't belong to any um, particular group. Everybody has okay. this claim. Yeah, I, on I just. It. Like I, I shouldn't have put it that way. Like my, my brother-in-law playing the sitar. I'm not saying don't play the sitar. I'm not saying that you're not appreciating Indian culture. You're even adopting it to yourself. And let's say he starts playing because he, he loves Jimi Hendrix, right? He, he, he was born in Washington State near Seattle. He loves Jimi Hendrix. The guy, he started playing mm -hmm. music. By, so if he started playing Jimi Hendrix on the sitar, I'm not going to say, oh, you're appropriating culture. No, no, I'm not talking about that. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe we should, you know, like, again, a woman in Finland who's never been to India who sees a picture of a sari and falls in love with it and wants to wear it every day, good on you. You know, I have no mm. problem with that. But mm. someone turning around saying, like my brother-in-law saying, well, in our culture, like saying, well, you know, like we grew up the same way, we have the same, you know, in our thinking, women do this, right? No, no, I'm sorry. The problem is he's trying to put that on you as well. So yeah, he's trying yeah, to dictate to yeah. you yeah. what your idea so I'm fine with what he decides his identity yeah. is, but it's because he's dictating to yeah. you. Yeah. That's, but, that, to but, me, is the, the but, crux of the problem. Okay, again, you like Indian music, you cook Indian foods, you only wear Indian clothes. You've never been to India. I, I'm not saying this about him because he has been to India. He's learning the language and you know he's actually gotten fairly okay in Urdu. Um, I mean, it's been over 20 years, but... Now I would say he's got more claim to it when, than when he said he did. But like, if you're doing all that, but all you know about it is the the cooking, the clothes, and Bollywood movies, and you want to talk about claiming Indian culture, and I'm not saying again, I'm not trying to essentialize what it is, but those three things aren't Indian culture. That's that's a stereotype of Indian culture in a way, right? If, oh, I eat butter chicken and I wear saris and I listen to Bollywood, I love Indian culture. Like, no. Butter uh, chicken, you know. It's like, a stereotype, but it's, it's also <laughs> true. You know, many of my Indian friends do all those three things. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, no, but okay, my, my roommates in Vancouver, oh, we love Indian food. And the only thing they would ever eat is butter chicken. I'm like, well, that's not Indian that's food. Start. Okay, no, but no, but they would never get anything different. They would never, or they, if they ordered Indonesian, they would only order nasi goreng. It's like, okay, you like nasi goreng, you like butter chicken. Why don't you try something else? And you might not, you know, if you like, if you try everything else off the menu and you don't like anything else except for the nasi goreng, you don't like Indonesian food, you like nasi goreng. There, you know, there's a difference, right? So, you know, it, 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 it's this essentializing. Yeah, I freely admit I don't like Chinese food because I only like crispy duck. 
I probably haven't had the good stuff. I've never been to China, or I have been to Singapore, and that I did have some good Chinese food there. But generally, I'm sorry to any Chinese people listening to this, except unless you're with the CCP, in which case, fuck you. But otherwise, um, <laughs> I I don't like Chinese food. Okay, China. So identity. This is you know, well, I guess for you a little bit. Uh, Hong Kong. The protesters, especially like now it's getting even worse, but like if you went back to December and if you went back to, you know, like, like late last year, they were holding up British and American flags, right? I mean, these people have a claim to a British identity. They were a British protectorate, yes. right? So it's, and when I say a claim to it, I mean, like they were brought up underneath that system. Um, you know, my dad went to English schools. My dad went to university. He went to the UK. Like the schools he went to were British schools in India. Like he went through a British education system. He's got some claim to Dickens and, you know, like the world does, right? But like, so same thing with these people in Hong Kong. So I, you know, I saw what you did this morning. I, I do think Commonwealth countries should open up the doors to Hong Kong citizens at this point. And I, like, you know, I, I believe in, good immigration policy but in in the case of refugees and whatnot i have no problem but you do what you can take care of like you know so i mean these people have a claim to british identity if you want to go down to macau they have a claim to portuguese identity and when i say claim it's not like no one has a claim to that or whatever but like they have a connection and a heritage to it that you know someone who grew up in uh, I don't know, Finland doesn't, right? Even though Finland's closer, they're the same color, whatever. Someone who grew up in Hong Kong, I think, has a more of a connection to British mm. culture than someone from Finland. Mm. It's and, and that claim doesn't mean that someone from Finland can't put on a kilt, eat haggis, and play the bagpipes. <laughs> you know? And someone in Hong Kong does none I of those things. <laughs> To me, uh, the only the only consideration, if we're thinking about, so we're talking now about neutral. I I don't think about it as more superficial and more fundamental things. I think of it as more like artistic expressions of culture versus sociological expressions of culture. So artistic expressions of culture are all fine to me. Um, I mean, they are value neutral. Mm -hmm. I. Um, it's just a matter of, of kind of taste. Yeah. Um, whether you prefer Indian, Indian or Chinese or Indian cuisine, for example, this is just purely about taste. I mean, li in that yeah. case, literally about yeah. taste. But um, and there are sociological elements of culture. And to me, the question is, with those, is only are they good or bad? And uh, if they're neutral, then then your choices are neutral. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm concerned about cultural aspects of culture that are bad, and that is it. So, for example, when people say um, we shouldn't take, I, I don't know, some very um, uh, conservative Muslim immigrants into the UK because that's not our culture, my feeling is no. We uh, if we're going to um, if we're going to distinguish between different types of immigrants and take some and not others, then we should discriminate against somebody who is a very strict Muslim, because that is not a good is not a good culture. That is the sociological aspects of that are not good, not because it's not our culture. So I that that's my that's my feeling. Um, the reason that I don't want to wear. Um, hijab is not because it's not my culture, but because I actually think wearing hijab is oppressive and I hate the symbolism of it. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel that there's a, there's a whole bunch of value neutral things mm -hmm. within culture. I discourage them from appreciating culture that are actually bad. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I don't want them to start. I don't want okay, you're breaking up. Wearing hijab is objectively. Oh, bad. Oh, sorry. I don't want... Can you hear me now? Yep. I don't want white women to start wearing hijab because I think hijab is objectively bad, not because it's not their culture. So I think that's a, that's a little bit of a 
a difference there. Um, and culture is malleable and, and changeable. So I do think that uh, when you accept the immigrants who are very um, strict Islamic um, fundamentalists or something, you have no idea how that will go. You don't know how they will, uh, you don't know to what extent they will influence other people in the UK and to what extent the UK will influence them. And we do know that influences go in all directions. So, for example, um, we've had problems in the U in the UK with FGM, mm -hmm. and um, there's been a lot of cowardice about not wanting to prosecute um, FGM cases because of cultural sensitivity, quote unquote. Um, that's bad. People are coming from countries where they perform FGM, and they are bringing that culture to our country. Um, and so therefore some some little girls are, are un undergoing FGM who wouldn't otherwise have undergone FGM. However, the, the opposite thing is also happening, which is that people who um, have lived in the UK who have returned to African countries where they practiced FGM mm -hmm. are much less likely to do practice or support FGM when they return and you can act you can see a knockoff you can see a, a quite striking mm. knockoff effect returnees have been influenced by the culture where they were yeah. um, and returnees are coming back with more enlightened views and as a result fewer girls are, are having FGM in those countries so influences go both ways yeah. um, no, but okay when you said okay uh the, 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 someone who's like a Salafist, right? So like, you know, to go about mm, as strict mm. as Islamic as you can, right? Like a Salafist or a Wahhab, a Wahhabist. No, I, I, if you have a choice between five people who are immigrating and they're all equally qualified, and this is the same thing, like, you know, all governments look at... Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I'm not... I, I, I would prioritize... I would prioritize atheists uh, or, um, and secularists. Uh, no, uh, for, I mean, it doesn't even need to be for cultural reasons. Yeah. Those people are more endangered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would I would prioritize gay men. I would take single women over mm -hmm. other groups because yeah. they're more endangered. But okay. Um, but again, it, just to get off for Islam for a second. If there's someone, let's say, a hardcore Orban supporter from Hungary, yo, who's wearing, yo who's goose stepping along and he wants to immigrate to Canada or the UK. I would have issues yeah, with no, that I person. Prefer, well. Yeah, I prefer not to have him. I definitely don't want a bunch of Hindu ethno-nationalists yeah, to come to yeah. the UK. There's already enough of them here. But at the go, other time... Go away. <laughs> but on the other, other side of that, Canada used to do something and they've stopped doing it. And they stopped doing it a while ago because of money. But when... People came here as new immigrants. They were given, it wasn't much. It was just, you know, in Canada, we respect everyone's rights to do whatever. It was like a two week long course. It wasn't anything intensive, right? You're not getting a, you're not getting the history of Canadian jurisprudence or anything like that. It's just basic walking through enlightenment values, like basic, you know, decent human values, right? And this is what we, this is what we respect in Canada. They stopped doing that. Now the immigration process to Canada is about 18 months. In that 18-month time, while you're just sitting there waiting for paperwork to come back and forth, if they said, take this online course, and then during some of your interviews, they asked you questions, and it was just, again, basic little things, so that when you know that skinhead from Hungary comes over, they can hold those ideas. I mean, that, that's the whole point of the Enlightenment. You can hold those ideas. Don't force them on anyone else. Don't discriminate against anyone else for job, for you know, housing, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So if that person comes in and they still hold those ideas, but then their kids grow up and they're learning enlightenment values or, you know, mm -hmm. human values, universal human values, they could reject. So I want to have enough confidence in the system that, like you said, you know, the, the exchange does go back and forth. But if you come in and you just say, well, you're an immigrant, yeah. this is your identity, you have to be this, you have to be that, and they don't tell you the other side of it, or you keep hearing in the press that Canada is an explicitly racist country, which is starting up again, or the UK is 
systemically racist and they're out to kill, you know, they're out, they're hunting down immigrants. You're not welcome here, blah, 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 blah. They're, they won't want to... Yeah, f- I mean, I think that the, U- the neither the UK nor Canada are blameless, but I do think that they are two of the least racist places on earth. Um, and I think that as, uh, assimilation is very, very important. And assimilation shouldn't mean erasing the neutral elements of your culture, um, the, the aesthetic or artistic elements for, or culinary or whatever. Most definitely not. And it also um, shouldn't be thought police. I mean, a healthy democracy should be able to live with a certain number of people who have extreme and even pernicious mm. ideas, because we can't police what ideas people have. Um, but we um, we should definitely um, s- stand up for certain values, not because they're our values, but because they're good values. Um, and we're in a position to be able to promote them. We should, pr- when we're in a position to be able to promote them, we should promote them. And that seems like the kind of circumstance in which that should happen. I think that the message that you want to give is everybody is part of this together. I think civic nationalism is extremely important. And this kind of racial essentialism goes against civic nationalist values. And I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. But again, when you say civic nationalism, people are like, oh, you want to be a Nazi, right? No, I think there is, I think part of the problem no, too. civic, civic, yeah, 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 yeah. civic <laughs> nationalism. But as soon as you say, but, no, but again, I think that's part of the problem. Like, I, I can only speak to Canada and a bit to the United States about this. When I went to school, and you know, whatever, I will sound like an old man here, uh, but we were taught about her. Oh, by we are we are both old. old. <laughs> yeah, I know. we are. Both. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've got to face it. <laughs> oh, I know, but but like we These were taught youngsters. Oh, I they're know. Terrible, aren't they? Yeah, they're with their lousy, loud rock music. <laughs> but like I was taught, <laughs> we were taught about your rights, you know, your 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 freedom of speech. But we were also told about our civic responsibilities. Like you have a response, you know. I, I hear it from the libertarians in the states. Oh, there is no such thing as a community. It's all about individualism. It's like, no. Even the founders of the United States, it's it's to form a more perfect union, right? It's the United States of America. They, they, they took many things and they formed a union. It is about coming together as a community based on these principles of the Enlightenment, that these values belong to everyone. And yes, fine. I mean, we can have the argument about the slavery and everything with the founding fathers, but the ideas were there. And if you follow them through, you abolish slavery, you... You know, get rid of Jim Crow. You get the civil rights. You get all that. So, yeah. You know, the the founding fathers were deeply hypocritical, but that doesn't mean we are no, are it, or it, need to be exactly. And it's but I'm just saying that these values <clears throat> are what should be pushed. Like when I say I want Canadian identity, you know, it's it's not just eating poutine and maple syrup and playing hockey, right? Oh God. You eat poutine. Oh, poutine is one of the most... I'm sorry, oh, you're cancelled. Oh, no, it's one of the most amazing things in the world. I'm um, hor- horrified. When, okay. I went, when I went to Montreal, I, mm-hmm. I had poutine, and people did warn me. They said, you should try it once, but, you know, with great care, um, with, depa- great, with it- caution, at your own risk. And I did, and I went to the place that the Canadians, that the locals recommended, pe- mm. local people who liked poutine recommended. Okay. It was so bad. I don't know. I it's it's <laughs> okay. You don't you don't have fri- you, you don't have fries and sauce in the, in the UK, like chips and sauce. Um, yeah, some people do. I mean, up 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 in northern England, yeah. up, up north when they're where they're kind of uncivilized. You know, the bit <laughs> where the map it says "Here be dragons." <laughs> there, there are people who have curry sauce in their chips. Okay, but uh, no, okay, I, I guess but I, they I, don't put like cheese curds on top. Oh, cheese curds are great. I but, I have mayonnaise with, I have mayonnaise with my chips. So do I. I have mayonnaise with or my fries. Or salt and malt. I I I like my. Yes. The first time the first time I went to Europe, I was traveling on my own. My aunt, my aunt and uncle lived in Switzerland, and we were going traveling around. We stopped at a McDonald's to eat, and ketchup was ten cents, uh, or whatever the, and the mayonnaise was free. 
So I just got the mayonnaise because it was free. And I and ever since then, I'm like, this is really good. So I've been eating fries with mayonnaise since then. So, but, but, but I mean, like I said, for yeah, me, the, but for me, the Canadian thing was learning about those rights, learning about those freedoms, right? Listening to my dad talk about India and how, you know, Indira Gandhi was not a nice woman. India was not an open, great <laughs> society, you know, like until the 90s. It, it was very close and it was very restrictive. My dad was telling me about these things. I would go back and I would see it. And I was like, no, no, this, so for me, it's those, those values. Maybe I grew up thinking this is a Canadian thing, but no, when you read them and when you read the history of them, like that's a culture that we no, should share so globally. Yeah. Well, I, yes, I feel that too. It's like Argentine tango. It's the birthright of humanity. Um, that's how I feel about no, it. But for me, it's, it's, it's anything, right? Like, um, okay, Argentine tango. If you're like, you know, Joe Rogan is into Brazil, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Okay. Is that, that shouldn't be only the purview mm -hmm. of Brazilians and it shouldn't be the only the purview of, you know, uh, Asians because that's where martial arts came from. But it's, you know, my, my brother-in-law liking the sitar, like, all these things, this is this is what culture is about. It's we, we find ideas that we like. I mean, if you look at Japan, they were a very closed off society. The only time they got new ideas in was when they attacked China or China attacked them and Japan lost horribly. <laughs> you know, and but they got new aspects of culture in, right? That's how I mean, yeah. you get that culture by interacting. You get that culture by crossing back and forth. But I don't know, I, I still think since the late nineties the focus has been on racial identity. It's been based on creating divisions. Like, it's, we'll, it, it was like the Quebec separation. At one point, one of the people pushing for Quebec separation said, we will separate Quebec, we will get our own passport and our own money, and then we'll bring a road back to join Canada. I'm like, pardon? So that's what I see, like, these people who are pushing this racial identity. It's, we'll divide everyone by racial identity. We'll figure out what that identity is. And once we know all that, then we can come back together in harmony. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Let's, let's talk about what our similarities are. And yes, we can talk mm -hmm. about ho historic oppressions. Like, I, I don't want to hide that. But don't talk about it wallowing in them. I, I lived in the, uh, I lived in Inuit communities for four years. And I Okay, I can tell you about the residential schools. I can tell you the difference between an Inuit community and a First Nations res reservation now in Canada. I, they're, they're two separate, you know, the way the First Nations in Southern Canada and the way the Inuit live, they, they're two completely different systems. They have a lot of similar issues, uh, but they're not reservations and they don't get, uh, like the Inuit don't get government funding in the same manner that the, the other First Nations do. Mm -hmm. But but I can tell you about the issues of the residential schools. I can tell you about what happened. Every program that I've seen, because I have friends who worked with social services, I have friends who worked for child protective services, I had friends who worked in the health department up there, and I had friends who worked for the school and the school board up there. Every problem that was done was done in the way of, you people were victims. Instead of saying, okay, you were victims, we will help you overcome that. It was always, you've been victims, you've been victimized, you're still victims, you're still facing it. There was nothing about resilience. There was nothing about getting stronger. It was always, we'll do this because you were victims and you're still being victimized. We have to fix your victimhood. It, mm. it, it, it was not yeah, a question. Res resilience is very important. Mm. I also think that um, what you said about needing to find the things that we have in common, that is, that is crucial. The way that we build a healthy society mm. is through shared goals. Yeah and empathy with each other and understanding that uh, if everybody has hardship, everyone has suffering. That doesn't mean to say that some people are not more discriminated against than others. But the reason why we can, the reason why we care about discrimination is because we have empathy, because we understand mm. um, what it means to, to suffer. Um, and there's, there seems to be a presumption from a lot of people that empathy is impossible. You can't understand my experience unless you have my skin color. Right, well, stay in your lane. Um, <laughs> yeah. I hate that. But yeah, but I mean, it's the same thing too. Like the, the victimhood that I worked, like I said, I, I, I worked in over, overseas and I worked on military bases. Now in NATO, in Afghanistan, you had at one point 26 countries. And then there was also that you had other countries that were from the Middle East and you had Mongolian troops and you had that were not included as part of this joint task force. Now, on a base, 
you know, you've got, yes, fine, you can have the Northern European nations, but there's a vast mixture. If you look at the British army, there was Indians, black, you know, black people from Africa, black people from the Caribbean, Pakistanis, Sikhs, uh, you know, the British military was a mix of everything. U, uh, U S military was black, you know, Hispanic mainly, and then whites, uh, Canadian military, same thing, a lot of mixture. I have never seen a fairer place than working on those bases. It didn't matter who you were. If you didn't do your job, they didn't care. If you proved that you could do your job, we had a goal. Everyone had a, you know, like you said, a shared goal or shared, shared vision. There it's a little bit narrower because it's a specific mission for the military. But the mission for your country should be everyone's treated more fairly and just and then evaluate the systems, how that's done. And I don't think, I think that second step, that evaluation step is missing and everyone's just going, we got to focus on race or we have to focus on identity. Like we have to focus on the queer identity. We have to focus on the racial identity. We have to focus on, you know, they're not focusing on the issues they're focusing on the identity. Oh, by it, I need to. Yeah, I was, was going to say. We gonna, have friends arriving yeah, this was, evening. But um, um, I'll give you the last word. If you got anything to say, mm-hmm. push, push your books, push your podcast, push whatever you want. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, uh, well, you can find me at Twitter at Iona Italia. Um, I also, um, I have written two books on tango and they are not how-to books or technical books for dancers. They are, it's a kind of sociological and philosophical um, ruminations and I use dance as a kind of jumping off point uh, for thoughts about human relationships, society, sensuality sexuality learning and other topics so if that sounds fun to you check that out i have a i'm writing a book about um uh, mixed race indians it's called the the half casts it's with working title and i'm using some material that from my stay in india and if you look for me iona italia and the half cast on youtube you can find me reading from the from the um, preface to that book. So please go and check that out. And um, if you are interested in um, in staying, staying in touch, then send me an email. Uh, and everything, all my social media is at the same address, iona.italia, and my email is gmail.com. Everything oh. I have is at iona.italia on Twitter, on, on Facebook, on Instagram. I'll include all that in the show notes. Uh, just before I let you go, because I, I was just, I got a little ding and I was just checking something. Helen's mortal enemy is doing another video on Twitter. That American woman who does the, shows you how to make tea. Do you remember her? Like the, there's an American woman that shows you how, people how to make tea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Yeah. You're, you're completely. I, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm glad that she's still alive because Helen has taken out a hit on her. Okay, but she's done another. Um, she's done another one show, showing people how to make a. She's doing another one showing how to people make a full English breakfast, and she takes a piece of, like she must be stopped. <laughs> yeah, she must. <laughs> it's it's horrible. Full English is bad enough as it is, but what she's doing is even worse. Anyways, thank you very much, Iona. Thank you everyone for listening, and I'll be back. Yeah. Oh, by it, I need to. Go yeah, I was, I was going to say. We I was, have friends arriving yeah, this was, evening. But um, um, I'll give you the last word if you got anything to say. Mm-hmm. Push, push your books, push your podcast, push whatever you want. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, uh, well, you can find me at Twitter at Iona Italia. Um, I also, um, I have written two books on tango, and they are not how-to books or technical books for dancers. They are, it's a kind of sociological and philosophical um, ruminations. And I use dance as a kind of jumping off point uh, for thoughts about human relationships, society, sensuality, sexuality, learning and other topics. So if that sounds fun to you, check that out. I have a, I'm writing a book about um, uh, mixed race Indians. It's called The ha- the half casts with working title and I'm using some material that from my stay in India and if you look for me Iona Italia and the half cast on YouTube you can find me reading from the from the um, 
preface to that book. So please go and check that out. And um, if you are interested in um, in staying in, staying in touch, then send me an email. Uh, and everything, all my social media is at the same address. I own a dot Italia. My email is gmail.com. Everything oh. I have is at I own a dot Italia on Twitter, on on Facebook, on Instagram. I'll include all that in the show notes. Uh, just before I let you go, because I, I was just, I got a little ding and I was just checking something. Helen's mortal enemy is doing another video on Twitter, that American woman who does the, shows you how to make tea. Do you remember her? Like the, there's an American woman that shows you how, people how to make tea. Hello? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry yeah. you completely... I, I mean, I'm... I'm I'm glad that she's still alive because Helen has taken out a hit on her. Okay, but she's done um, another. She's done another one show, showing people how to make a. She's doing another one showing how to people make a full English breakfast, and she takes a piece of, like she must be stopped. <laughs> yeah, she must. <laughs> it's it's horrible. Full English is bad enough as it is, but what she's doing is even worse. Anyways, thank you very much, Iona. Thank you everyone for listening, and I'll be back. Yeah. Oh, by it, I need to. Go yeah, I was, was going to say. We have friends arriving yeah, this evening. But um, um, I'll give you the last word if you got anything to say. Mm. Push, push your books, push your podcast, push whatever you want. To. Um, yes. Uh, uh, well, you can find me at Twitter at Iona Italia. Um, I also, um, I have written two books on tango, and they are not how-to books or technical books for dancers. They are, it's a kind of sociological and philosophical um, ruminations. And I use dance as a kind of jumping off point uh, for thoughts about human relationships, society, sensuality, sexuality, learning and other topics. So if that sounds fun to you, check that out. I have a, I'm writing a book about um, uh, mixed race Indians. It's called The Hot. The half casts it, it's working title, and I'm using some material that from my stay in India. And if you look for me, I own Italia and the half cast on YouTube. You can find me reading from the from the um, preface to that book. So please go and check that out. And um, if you are interested in um, in staying in, staying in touch, then send me an email um, and. Everything, all my social media is at the same address. I own a dot Italia. My email is gmail.com. Everything I'll, I have is at I own a dot Italia on Twitter, on on Facebook, on Instagram. I'll include all that in the show notes. Uh, just before I let you go, because I, I was just, I got a little ding and I was just checking something. Helen's mortal enemy is doing another video on Twitter. That American woman who does the, shows you how to make tea. Do you remember her? Like, there's an American woman that shows you how people how to make tea. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. you you completely. I, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad that she's still alive because Helen has taken out a hit on her. Okay, but she's done um, another. She's done another one show, showing people how to make a. She's doing another one showing how to people make a full English breakfast, and she takes a piece of. Like, she must be stopped. Yeah, she must. <laughs> it's it's horrible. Full English is bad enough as it is, but what she's doing is even worse. Anyways, thank you very much, Iona. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and I'll be back. Yeah. Oh, by it, I need to go yeah, I was, I was gonna say I was, we have friends arriving yeah, this was, evening. But um, um, I'll give you the last word if you got anything to say. Mm -hmm. Push push your books, push your podcast, push whatever you want to <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, uh, well, you can find me at Twitter at Iona Italia. Um, I also, um, I have written two books on tango and they are not how-to books or technical books for dancers. They are, it's a kind of sociological and philosophical um, ruminations and I use dance as a kind of jumping off point uh, for thoughts about human relationships, society, sensuality, sexuality, learning, and other topics. So if that sounds fun to you, check that out. I have a, I'm writing a book about um, uh, mixed race Indians. It's called The, the Half Casts, it, it's working title. 
and I'm using some material that from my Stay in India. And if you look for me, Iona Italia and the Half Cast on YouTube, you can find me reading from the from the um, preface to that book. So please go and check that out. And um, if you are interested in um, in staying in, staying in touch, then send me an email. Uh, and everything, all my social media is at the same address, Iona.Italia, and my email is gmail.com. Everything oh. I have is at Iona.Italia on Twitter, on, on Facebook, on Instagram. I'll include all that in the show notes. Uh, just before I let you go, because I, I was just, I got a little ding and I was just checking something. Helen's Mortal Enemy is doing another video on Twitter, that American woman who does the, shows you how to make tea. Do you remember her? Like, there's an American woman that shows you how people how to make tea. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. you're, you're completely. I mean, I mean I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad that she's still alive because Helen has taken out a hit on her. Okay, but she's done um, another. She's done another one show, showing people how to make a. She's doing another one showing how to people make a full English breakfast, and she takes a piece of. Like, she must be stopped. Yeah, she must. It's it's horrible. Full English is bad enough as it is, but what she's doing is even worse. Anyways, thank you very much, Iona. Thank you everyone for listening, and I'll be back. Yeah. Oh, bye. I need to. Go yeah, I was, was going to say. We gonna, have friends arriving yeah, this was, evening. But um, um, I'll give you the last word if you got anything to say. Mm-hmm. Push push your books. Push your podcast. Push whatever you want. <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, well, you can find me at Twitter at Iona Italia. Um, I also, um, I have written two books on tango and they are not how-to books or technical books for dancers. They are, it's a kind of sociological and philosophical um, ruminations and I use dance as a kind of jumping off point uh, for thoughts about human relationships, society, sensuality, sexuality, learning, and other topics. So if that sounds fun to you, check that out. I have a, I'm writing a book about um, uh, mixed race Indians. It's called The The Half Casts, with working title. And I'm using some material that from my stay in India. And if you look for me, Iona Italia and The Half Cast, on YouTube, you can find me reading.